One lock have three basic questions, and I'm going to exclude Fred <coughs> here. So, what questions do you think wildlife have when they get into an area? Water. Water, absolutely. Very good. Cover. Cover. There you go. This is this, this pretty basic, folks. All right. So the, the three questions the wildlife have is: Where's the water? What is there to eat? Where can I hide? Okay. And we think, well, that's just wildlife. Okay, in 2017, I found out that we're not that much different than wildlife put in the right situation. Because I hiked uh, 1,700 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail, and when you met other hikers, you wanted to exchange information, and we, 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 and we did that. And so the questions we had was, where's the next water? And if, and if the next water source was a water cache, we want to know how likely is there to still be water at that cache? Because if there wasn't, you were going to have to carry water to the cache and beyond. Okay? And then the, you've been eating all this trail food for several days. You come into a town and you want to know where's a good place to eat. Okay, we want, we want to get uh, maybe some vegetables in you that you haven't been able to get when you're out on the trail. And, uh, and then the uh, last question is, where's a good place to camp? So it's fairly similar. Uh, with, with wildlife, it's water, food, and cover. And you, you nailed it. With the hikers, it's water by far and away number one. Uh, what, what is there to eat in the town food, and then we're going to set up my shelter. Those were the basic questions. So this evening, I'm going to talk a little bit about habitat, and then what I call the pieces of the habitat. That's a project I've been working on, and then we'll work on the, the whole. All right. So habitat is where an animal lives. It's their home. Okay, and it also is the type of environment that you would be most likely to find that animal. So after I started working for the Soil Conservation Service and they were sending me away to trainings, I figured out fairly quickly the habitat that some of the folks were going to go to. Because after the day's session, there was a lot of folks you would find in one of the local taverns uh, sucking down a, down a few from about 5 o'clock until about 9 o'clock in the evening. That was their habitat. And, it, it, and if you walked in there, you were very likely to find them. Okay, so that's uh, interesting. So food and water are fairly easy to understand, but cover is a little different. Uh, and so we need different types of cover. So, they, so wildlife needs cover to travel and to rest. They need travel uh, cover to roost. They need uh, cover to feed and to drink. They need cover to hide their young and raise their young. They need cover to breed and to, to nest. So, so, and for each item, they may need a, need a little different type of cover. All right. And so I think we all recognize that there's good habitats and there's bad habitats. Good habitats will have the right combination of food, water, and cover arranged in such a way that it meets the needs of that wildlife species, or maybe several wildlife species. Okay? And for poor habitats, sometimes it's missing something that's fairly critical. Maybe there's no place to hide, maybe there's no water, maybe there's not much to eat. Or maybe they've got all three. They've got water, the habitat's got cover, it's got some food, but all three of them are pretty marginal. And so nothing, nothing very, very good. Habitats vary. And they vary by the historic land use and the current land use and the management that's been, been applied. So in eastern Washington, how many thousands of acres were converted to winter wheat? A lot. Okay. How many uh, 
acres in central Washington were converted to irrigated cropland or orchards, a lot. And in some cases, it's some fairly critical habitat has been converted. Uh, you know, a lot of times you're, you're looking where uh, in the, the Chelan, Wenatchee area, and the places where they put in the orchards used to be winter browse for the deer. That's where he had lots of uh, bitter brush. So, so that, that changes. Um, also, many, many acres have been grazed. Going way back, there were bands of sheep. Drumheller was uh, originally a sheep range. And, uh, and the question with whether it was sheep grazing or cattle grazing, how was it grazed? Was it lightly grazed, moderately grazed, or heavily grazed? And then we've had a lot of fires in the last 10 years, and so if a fire has recently come through an area, it could dramatically alter the habitat. And one of the first things that might be missing after the fire is a sagebrush. Okay. And ha habitats also vary from landform to landform. So think about the ridge top and then these hill slopes of different aspects. Uh, there are benches, there are slats, there are stream areas, and there's dry washes. And all of these can have different types of habitat. Habitat can also vary by soil type. Are we talking about a soil that's this deep, or is it three feet or six foot deep? That varies. Uh, also, what's the texture? Are we talking about a silt loam soil, or are we talking about a sand? And, the, and, and, and depending on the answer, we're going to get a lot of different types of vegetation out there. Uh, and also how much rock is in that soil profile. The more rock that's in it, the less water that's available for, for plants. So that has an impact. And then uh, effective precipitation. You know, there's a certain amount of precipitation that falls. Uh, and so we get some of it in the form of snow. And, and so if we're on a, um, a basin or a bottom area, we may be collecting water from those uphill sites. Or if, if we're in an area and uh, anything downhill, we may, you know, that site may give up some water. Um, the other things that help an impact is the aspect. Does that slope face north or south? or east or west. And there's a huge difference between a northeast facing aspect and the southwest facing aspect. I mean, it, it just, the amount of solar radiation that, that a site gets when it's in that south, southwest type position is just, it, it, it's enormous. Um, percent slope, elevation, all of those things can, can help some, some bearing and impact. And so with all these different site variations, we get different plant communities, and different plant communities, that means different habitats. Okay? And so now we're gonna talk about the pieces of habitat, and this ties in with the project that I've been working on the last few years. In fact, before I officially walked at the door as a retired employee, they hired me back under a different mechanism to, to, to work on this. So uh, I haven't really had a retirement yet. I've been semi-retired. But, it, but it's been, uh, been, been a, lot of, a lot of fun, too. Uh, and so as I talk about these different pieces of the habitat, think about water, food, and cover. Those, it really doesn't get much more difficult than that. So the very shallow soils are really less than eight inches of the depth, a lot of times maybe three or four. They may have rock in it. Uh, the lower part of that may have clay in it. Uh, there's a, oftentimes a lot of surface rock. Uh, and there's not a lot of bare ground because it's got a very good soil body crust. Lichens and moss cover up almost everything else. It's a site that's fairly stable. Uh, here you see. Let's see if this slide's going to pop up. Mm 
I may have to close this down and open it back up to get it to uh, work. Sorry about that. It was working earlier. Ah, here we go. We probably need to cut the light, Fred. All right, so this is a very shallow ecological site. The uh, gray shrub there is called steel sagebrush. And you can see a lot of surface rock here on this site. Um, and we'll go to the... And so this shows, you can see a scattered stiff sagebrush. Look at the little tufts here of grass. That's called Sandberg bluegrass. It probably has leaves that are two to three inches long, a real spindly looking seed head. It's a, almost a known nothing grass, all right? Because there's not a lot of production to it. But my contention is that that little grass might be one of the most important plant species for wildlife that we have because it has a characteristic that every fall it will green up and if you look in where it are the upland birds in late fall winter and very early spring they're picking the green out of that sandbird bluegrass okay and i've seen elk and deer pawing through the snow to get down to those green tufts. And those, those little green shoots have nutrients that they can get nowhere else because everything else is dry forage. And, and so it's those little shots of nutrients that help them get through the winter time. So it's a very important species. All right. Um, a loamy or a stony ecological site are very similar. They've got moderately deep to deep soil. Uh, the stony, as you might expect, has got a lot of rock in the profile. Both of these sites are a Wyoming sagebrush, a blue much wheatgrass site. And so you can see this is a, a loamy site. Uh, look at the density of the green bunch grass. Also, look at the size of it compared to the sandbird bluegrass. So, much more productive, pretty good uh, situation for the wildlife to come into. This is a stony site, a little bit of a hill slope. Uh, it's been grazed moderately to maybe a little beyond that. Uh, it's got Wyoming sagebrush, bluebush wheatgrass in that. If you take this site and push it pretty hard with grazing, it goes to this. Heavy sagebrush and not much else. Okay. And then a cool loamy. This is a site that you find on north facing slopes or a little higher elevation uh, areas that get a little more moisture. So how many of you know where Leahy Junction is? Okay, a few of you do. Okay, so it's at the junction of Highway 17 and Highway 174. And that's about 1,900 foot of elevation. And, it, and when you're not on a saline type situation, you've got Wyoming sage and blue wheat wheatgrass. When you, and when you're driving then east going to Grand Coulee on Highway 174, fairly quickly you gain about 300 foot of elevation and you start to find a little bit of Idaho fescue in there, a little bit of uh, three-tip sagebrush and by the time you get up to about 2400, 2500 feet 
all the shrubs have dropped out. But that gives you an idea of th how things can, can change. Okay, so the gray shrub there is three-tip sagebrush. The grass is normally a mixture of blue butt sweet grass and Idaho fescue. And it's a this is this is a site that's, that means it's, it's been receiving a little extra effective moisture in order to have that. This is showing the cool loamy with a little bit of Wyoming sagebrush, a little bit of three-tip sagebrush. Uh, still has the grasses. And it, so now we're going to talk about two sites that are fairly similar and they're on top of Saddle Mountain, especially our areas that have got a lot of sand. So sandy loam soil texture, uh, fairly deep soil. This sandy loam is a shrub step. And you can see the uh, sagebrush, uh, the, the yellow flower plant is probably owl clover or Thompson paintbrush. And then uh, you've got a mixture of blue bunch sweetgrass and Idaho fescue. The companion site to this is a sandy, it's the same soil, a sandy loam, except it's got carbonates right up to the surface of that soil, and that means that there's going to be less water available to the plants. So instead of being shrub still, the sandy is a grassland site with cheap grass or needle and thread. And so in the background, you can see where the, sh the shrubs are. That's the sandy loam. And I've been up there and settled down, and I've had one foot in the sandy loam, one foot in the sandy, and this was back in about 1985, and I'm trying to figure out what the devil's going on here. There's no difference in management. We haven't had a fire that caused this. And, and so I'm digging holes on both sides. I'm texturing. I'm not a soil scientist, but identical. And it was... The difference is that on that in the foreground here is the sandy ecological side, and it is almost all needle and thread. And if it gets beat up, beat up by grazing, it goes from all needle and thread to all cheap grass. That's that's where that one goes to. And so that's uh, uh, push the wrong button. Okay, so now we're going to talk about one of my favorite ecological sites. It's uh, Lomi Bottom. It's positioned on the landscape in basins and draws. And it's got a lot of effective moisture because it's collecting water from upland sites. And because it's got good uh, uh, water flow through the system, it doesn't have a, a, a high water table. And, and because of that, we can have basin wild rock. Basin wild rock can be six foot, eight foot tall. You can have basin big sagebrush that's taller than, you, than yourself. And so this site has great hiding cover. And on those cold, windy days, it's a place for wildlife to kind of hunker down in, in all this grass and, and get, get out of the wind and keep themselves warmer. So this is a pretty wide flat. You see, look how tall and robust this uh, Basin Wild Rye is. And, uh, it, and it, er, it, this site burned about five years ago. And before that burn, it had quite a bit of sagebrush in this. The next slide shows how Basin Wild Rye you find normally. This is in a drainage way. And you see on the uphill sides, no basin wild rye or the different ecological side there. Um, and then let's look at one that it doesn't appear very often on the landscape. 2% of the landscape, maybe at the max, this riparian complex. And most of this area is all shrub step. It's got sagebrush, it's got bunch grasses, it's got wildflowers, no trees, except here in this riparian complex. So it is a site that really stands out. And so you can see the draw bottom that has uh, trees. 
and a rounded upland side, loamy, stony, cool, loamy, all, all these other, but no trees on that. And here's an interesting uh, slide here, shows uh, the riparian complex, and then you've got the uh, upland sites around that. And, and this kind of gives you a better landscape perspective that that riparian doesn't represent very much of the landscape. It's pretty, pretty minor in uh, comparison to other things. Two sites that normally are found fairly close together, uh, wetland complex and uh, wet meadow. The wetland complex is what I would call a classic wetland. It's got cattails or bulrush. Uh, oftentimes it has standing water. If it doesn't have standing water, the soil is just saturated for a long period of time. And there's a lot of plants that can't deal with those, those conditions. So, so that side is for wet, what they would call wetland obligate plants. That's obligated to be kind of in a wetland position. The wet meadow has a fairly high water table, but it will dry down 18 to 24 inches or so. And, and we're guessing, now the reason why I say we're guessing is that every wet meadow site in the state of Washington has been dramatically altered. Some have been drained and uh, farmed, others have been uh, heavily, heavily grazed, or they've uh, seeded, put in seeded uh, grasses on it. So this site is fairly striking. You can see in the background where the upland is, that's uh, shrub step, sagebrush and bunch grasses. In this corner here, you see some basin wild rye. That would be loamy bottom. All of this stuff that's dark green, that's a wet meadow. And then you see a couple of patches of cattails in there. And so you've got three or four sites all kind of in close proximity. And so that really does a good job of showing that the uh, wetland complex is only in certain areas. And that's where that are super saturated or the water is standing. And then around that you have uh, the wet meadow. So aspect makes a difference. I had been intending to put this next slide in and I keep forgot, forgetting about it and I put it in this afternoon. So this is looking above Ephrata. So I'm up here on the hilltop. This little east facing slope here is some very shallow. But look at the difference between the south facing aspect and the north facing aspect. The south aspect is all dry. It's primarily cheat grass with a scattering of shrubs. The north side still has a lot of native uh, plants on it. So they're all green at this point in time still. This was taken in May, I believe. And uh, it, that green side will have uh, uh, loamies and cool loamies and some pretty, pretty productive uh, areas there. Okay, so if we start to talk about the landscape, that's, that's the whole piece of habitat. It's only as good as the pieces. Okay, and so we're going to talk about pieces and I'm going to ask you some questions. And again, we're thinking in terms of water, food, and cover. So winter wheat, summer fallow. We've got thousands of acres of that across eastern Washington. Most of it has been farmed road to road. So this is some winter wheat before harvest. And so the question is, where's the water? We don't know. We, there may not be much water. Okay. What is there to eat? Wheat. Pardon? Just the wheat. So they can get the wheat. They can eat some of the kernels, so they can get, get some of the, the, the seeds of the wheat. 
Uh, they could, I'm, I'm assuming that those dry uh, wheat stalks will have some energy in it, so they can, they can do that. Um, where, where can they hide? Where? In the wheat. In the wheat. They can kind of hunker down. Now, let's say the wheat gets cut. Okay, so in the foreground, we've got some summer fallow. So where's the water? We don't, we don't know where we've got water there or not, do we? Um, where can they hide? There isn't much of a place to hide. What is there to eat? Not much. Now, in the background, you see the green. That's uh, green wheat. Absolutely, they will eat the green wheat. Years ago when I was hunting, my buddies and I would do some scouting before the season. The main thing we wanted to know is where's the green wheat? Because if we knew where the green wheat was, that altered kind of our, our plans for, for, for the hunt. Okay, so now we take this wheat fowl situation and we put some CRP or conservation reserve in there. And this is a photo of some Conservation Reserve Field. It's all grasses. Uh, where they didn't get a good take, it's probably got cheap grass and other, other weeds in it. So, does this improve the water? No, doesn't improve the water. What about the food value with this wheat fallow system? Does that improve it a little bit? Yes. Okay, it does. Uh, what about uh, hiding cover? Better. It's, 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 it's better. Now, if we put this in Douglas County, that's a place that has very aggressive sagebrush, put a sprinkling of sagebrush across there, it, it's pretty good. A uh, story about CRP in Douglas County. Uh, we, we've been, about maybe 20 years ago now, we switched from seeding just crested wheatgrass on CRP to putting in more native. So, Seacar, Snake River wheatgrass, uh, Sherman big bluegrass, and we, we had uh, Sandberg bluegrass and some uh, thick spike wheatgrass. And so a little bit of diversity. And in Douglas County, they got a good, we, we were in a field and they got a good stand of grasses. Shrubs had come in, and you get to looking at a lot of the shrubs looked hedged. Well, they were hedged. They were, the sage grouse was using the heck out of them during the winter time, and there was all this droppings around all the sagebrush plants. And so from a distance, it kind of looked like native range, and then you stepped into it to go, okay, this is seeded grasses, but we're starting to approximate uh, what, what a native field would look like. So what does a wind farm do to the habitat? Okay. So here's some wind towers. I grew up in West Texas with the oil fields. The footprint of an oil field and the footprint of a wind farm are very similar because they've got a lot of dead end roads going to an oil well or a wind turbine. And, uh, and so in terms of habitat, uh, in terms of uh, cover, Cover's been taken out, so this is a, this is a downer for for wildlife. Think about the word fragmentation. That's what happens with uh, a wind farm. It fragments the, the habitat. Prior to that, you had a solid block. Now, not so much. Does the wind farm help with uh, wildlife water? No. Uh, does it help with uh, food for wildlife? No, it does not. And so people, when people, I hear people say, well, wind energy is a green source of energy. I'm going, well, it still comes at a cost. All right, so think about a housing development. And there's a lot of housing developments in different places have gone in. There was a period of time where in Colorado, they were losing hundreds of acres a day to a housing development. One, at one point. So besides water, food, and cover, we also need to think about predation, 
and disturbance. So we've got three houses we'll look at real quick. So, what is there to eat? The garden. <laughs> green, green grass. They'll, they will absolutely come in, come in there, and deer will, they'll, they'll get after the green grass. They love it. All right. Um, the, does, does housing development help with wildlife water? Depends. Maybe if, if they've got, if they've got, they're going to have a couple of steers out there. They've got to have some water for their steers. There might be some water that wildlife could access. Uh, in terms of food, we've got the green lawn, we've got the uh, shrubs, and going just the opposite, you have to think housing development in a, some of these places like this that some of the dogs and cats get taken by coyotes. So it kind of that kind of goes both ways just a, a little bit. Okay, so if we've got one house per 40 acres, is that what does that do in terms of disturbances? A little, little more disturbance out there? Yeah. What if, we, what if we make it one house per five acres? Now where are we at? And so you've got kids out there playing building forts. You've got uh, people on bicycles, dirt bikes. Uh, so, so there's quite a bit of disturbance. In Colorado, they did some research on housing development, so went into what was formerly rangeland, and they said for about a one mile radius around the housing developments here, there's a mile radius around that. It was a biological desert because of one of the most successful carnivores on the planet, and that's the American house cat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, they will, it, native species don't stand a chance against American cats, not at all. Okay, now, so we're going to think about some well-managed rangeland or shrub still and, and talk about what we might find out there. On the ridge top, we might have that very shallow side with the stiff sagebrush and the sandbird bluegrass. On the east-facing hill slope, it's probably a loamy soil, not much rock in it. It's probably got some shrubs in it. It's probably got some bunch grass, but it's probably got some sheep grass on it as well. Uh, if we go to the south aspect, it doesn't matter whether it's a loamy or a stony, it's probably going to have lots of cheap grass. And that's what we've got if we're, if we're walking up the Beasley Hill. That south aspect is, is not very good. The west aspect is normally pretty good. It's a stony. Does it get as much traffic as maybe some of the other aspects does? So it's got good bunch grass, it's got some shrubs on it, doing, doing fairly well. The north slope, this is where we would find the uh, Idaho fescue and the three-tip sagebrush. Okay. Now if we continue on, we've got at least one basin with that basin wall rhyme and head high basin big sagebrush. That's all pretty, pretty cool. We've got a depression that's got a little pocket of wetland. Uh, we, we've got a small area, but we do have a little bit of riparian con complex along the stream corridor. And then uh, well, a lot of times if you've got a, a big enough rangeland area you're looking at, somewhere on it you're going to have some rock outcrop or a talus rock slope. And on the downhill side of that you'll have quite a few shrubs. Okay, uh, We're saying that in this situation we've got an undeveloped spring. We've got one that's been developed. There's two livestock water troughs. And then we've had a field that's been seeded to crested wheatgrass. So my questions here, um, okay, so do we have a diversity of plant species here? Yes. Yeah, we've got a pretty good diversity. What about a diversity of habitats? Yeah, we've got that. Uh, what about uh, water? Yeah. We said we've got water. All right, so that, that's that's good. What about food? Yeah. yeah. We probably because if we got the native grasses, we probably also have the native wildflowers. Yeah. 
out there. We and 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 so we I went to a training session in Utah, and the whole thing was about why the cows eat what they eat. Okay, and one of the things is they say their central nervous system is tied to their gut, and if they eat something, it gives them a warm, fuzzy feeling. They want more of it. Okay, and if it makes them sick, they they, they avoid it. Well, I think the same can probably be said of a lot of our wildlife species. They, because you go out there in the spring, sometimes there'll be 25, 30 different wildflowers. And certain wildflowers get eaten pretty heavily, some not as much. Uh, what about cover? So, a situation like this, what do you think? We're in pretty good shape with cover? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Okay, so let's now say we've got a project area that we want to put some habitat in. And I'm going to suggest about three things that we might consider when we're doing a habitat project. Number one is here's the project area. What type of habitats do we have around that project area? Okay, we need, need to have an understanding of that. We also need to have an understanding of the project area. What type of soils, what type of landscape position are we in? Uh, what, what, what about the aspect and soil type and those sorts of things? Because all that gives us the ecological site. And if we know the ecological site, then it tells us uh, capabilities, limitations, what species are adapted to the site? So if we're going to do a seeding, and I'm going to give you some sheets here, here in just a, a moment, and it'll, it'll show what we might be able to consider in terms of seeding. And then the third thing, I would consider putting in a different type of habitat than what is already there. Because if we, we just put in more of the same, that probably didn't didn't help wildlife a lot, but if we put in something that is totally missing out there, that would be pretty cool. Now we do know in the last number of years, we've had a number of wildfires across central Washington heaven. And so what we're probably missing from the landscape then might be shrubs, bitter brush, sagebrush. And so one thing we might consider doing is just putting in the shrubs put it in some shrubs and you make that as a seed source for other, other areas. Question that often time comes up, should we seed or not? And let's, say, let's say we've had a wildfire, and that's the question, should we seed or not? Well, if the area prior to the fire or has uh, less than 15% of these dominant bunch grasses, then seeding might be an option. But if we've got more than 15% of these dominant grasses, and we, maybe all we need to do is change the management and relieve the grazing pressure, the system will respond and normally the grasses will, will, will expand fairly well on their own. And so in the end, we've got the three basic questions. And you, know, you nailed it earlier, water, food, cover. All right. So why don't we turn the lights on, Fred, and I'm going to start handing some of these sheets out. Okay, so what, what I've got here, I have uh, made a photocopy of four different ecological sites, one page. And this, these are what we call the reference community. And we, call, we, we say that the reference community is the best of the best for that ecological site in terms of plant species, in, in terms of composition or proportion of species, in terms of plant community structure, 
and in terms of ecologic function. And ecologic function would be its a ability to withstand the forces of wind and rain and not have any erosion taking place. Or its ability to capture, store, and safely release all the precipitation that comes onto the site. And then biotic integrity it means that the site is able to hold on to all the, the functional and structural groups that are in the plant community and even most or all of the species. And so these tables here are set up very much the same. Look at the, look at the sheet that says very shallow. So at the top row is for shrubs. And you see we've got 25% uh, dominant low shrubs. Stiff sagebrush or one of the buckwheat species. Uh, the, the middle rows there are for grasses and grass-like. And you see the dominant short grass, Sandberg bluegrass, is dominant on this side. And then at the bottom is for wildflowers or native forbs. And so the production numbers are pounds per acre. So you see on the very shallow, it doesn't produce a lot of vegetation, 100 to 250 pounds. So this is kind of the low end of the scale in terms of production. Look on the back side of that page. It's the lonely bottom. And look at that bottom row and it says 3,000 to 5,000 pounds. A little bit of difference, you think? Okay, it has got shrubs, so there, but at that middle of the grass area, the basin wild rice says 70%. And if the site is good basin wild rice site, that site will raise its hand and make an announcement, I'm taking over. Okay, given a chance, I've seen it push out weeds, I've seen it push out native species, and it says, I'm claiming this site. Okay, um, and then the next page has sandy loam on one side and sandy on the other, and those were a couple of sites that I, I showed you as well. So the sandy loam has got a shrub component. You see 10% Wyoming sage, 5% other shrubs. It's got in the grass layer 65% it's kind of a mixture of needle and thread and blue blunt sweet grass. Okay? And then at the bottom, it's got about 10% native forbs. Production value, 500 to 800 pounds per acre. So not, not nearly as good as Lomi Bottom, but quite a bit better than very shallow. The back side of that is the sandy. And the first thing that strikes you is that top row, the shrubs are missing. It's missing because this is a grassland site. It doesn't seem to support shrubs at all. And so it's either, if you look at the, that dominant mid-grass, mid-sized bunch grass, the needle and thread, 85%. It is by far and away the dominant species in the, in the community. And, and as this thing starts to unravel and but because of uh, disturbance in grazing pressure, it goes from needle and thread to cheatgrass. Fairly simple uh, uh, description of the, of the model. It's got a few, some other species, but not a lot of them. And production, maybe a little bit lower than the sandy loam. But, so this is, this is either just four sites. Uh, I, I believe I wrote something like 59 different sites across central and eastern Washington. And there's, every one of them is different, but the, the form is all, everything's in the same form. And you go to the reference community for any other site, they look very similar to this. And so many, many times I had to ask myself, which major land area am I in and which ecological site am I working on? Because it was very easy to, to change, I mean, had two of them up on different screens, I'd change the wrong one, and then I'd have to X out without saving it. So, so I preserved what I had. But, uh, uh, so any questions that, that you might have about uh, habitats, any questions about these uh, ecological sites?